Okay, thanks for everybody for and welcome back to another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. We're very happy to have again Larry Summers with us from Harvard. Hi, Larry. It's good to have you on the program again. We will talk today about lessons from uh, Silicon Valley Bank's failure and what are the implications to the financial system more generally. So before we go in our <clears throat> discussion, I would like to go to the poll questions you answered so generously. I'm very grateful for that. And here are the poll questions and let's see uh, what your opinions uh, were. So the first question was, is the failure of the Silicon Valley Bank, is it very specific because it was a very particular bank or is it really a, a sign of weakness of the financial architecture more generally? And the answer was 45% of you said it's very specific and 55% said it reveals a weakness of the financial architecture more generally. The second question was, is the bank's pricing power on demand deposits? So when the interest rate goes up, the deposit interest rate stays low. So the policy rate is for more than 4%, while most deposit rates only pay 1%. Is this unfair? Is this, does this fact that the banks can make a lot of profit in these circumstances contribute to financial stability? Or is this an asset? It's an asset for a, a bank. Should this be also reflected on the bank's balance sheet? So we should price it and put it on the bank's balance sheet as well. And or should this, you know, this pricing power be eliminated by having some CBDC, some digital dollar, which is bearing some interest rate based on the policy rate. So the banks don't have this pricing power anymore. And the answers you gave us, it's unfair. So you could choose more than one answers. It's 20% thought this way. It contributes to financial stability, 48% thought this way. It should be listed as an asset in the bank's balance sheets, only 24% thought this way. And we should introduce some interest-bearing CBDC to eliminate this pricing power, 18% uh, thought this way. A third question was about the current swift interventions by the regulatory authorities uh, and in handling this, was this good because it limits contagion or was it bad because it will create in the long run moral hazard? 75% thought it was a good a choice and only 25% thought it was um, a bad because it might induce moral hazard. About financial dominance, it was the fact that we have this financial instability, does it make an interest rate hike uh, less likely to contain inf uh, inflation because whenever we raise interest rates, we might bring more financial institutions into difficulties. Uh, it makes it less likely. That's what I thought, 60%. So there is some clear financial dominance. So financial uh, contagion is actually limiting this, the room uh, uh, this central bank has to rate interest rates. 29% thought it's the same. It doesn't change it. And it makes it less likely because uh, the Fed might show that there's no financial dominance and counteract this. It's only 11% thought this way. And finally, the last question was, uh, should the financial architecture be changed to one with a narrow banking system because the private banks are not really good in maturity transformation, particularly if it's government maturity transformed uh, into shorter term uh, papers. 26% thought only we should go to narrow banking. We should just do it with strict regulation. That's 74% 74 thought this way. So this gives us a little bit of a background. So we go now over these topics. Uh, we talk about what went wrong and you know what's about the bank's pricing power, the intervention and implications for monetary policy and lessons for the general financial architecture and also lessons for other countries uh, across the globe. So Larry, let me ask you what do you think went wrong prior to the eruption? And uh, you know perhaps you can outline your perspective a little bit. Was there too much easy monetary policy for too long? Regulation was weakened under the Trump administration and also the stress test might have been too benign and things like that. Uh, perhaps you can tell us your perspective uh, of the current the, crisis. Almost, almost all of the uh, above. That's usually true with respect to bad accidents that there are a lot of things that if they had been different, the bad accident would not have happened. This was a very poorly managed uh, bank, no chief risk officer for nine months, various problematic aspects in the culture, extremely rapid growth in uh, deposits attracted with uninsured deposits, paying uh, premium uh, rates, little attention to duration uh, mismatch. So the bank was badly managed, the supervisors, don't seem to have been 
on the case or to have paid attention, although this kind of prodigious growth is the classic thing that supervisors are supposed to be watching carefully going back to the SNL crisis uh, before. The extent of the duration mismatch is something that should have been and was caught by some observers and should have been uh, caught uh, by uh, regulators. Of course, this probably wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had a major spike in uh, interest rates, but there's no reason given the major spike in interest rates why this needed to have happened with competent uh, management and uh, competent uh, supervision. It certainly does point up a variety of issues with respect to the way in which we do uh, bank accounting, the way in which we fail to take account of uh, market adjustments in the value of the assets of uh, banks. And I think that has important implications for the structure of regulation. It has important implications for the way in which uh, banks are evaluated uh, going forward. So there are many different uh, causes old-fashioned mismanagement not noticed by supervision being at the center of them, aided and abetted by a range of the conceptual issues that are more interesting to uh, economists. Do you think that, you know, we have now, you said the SNL crisis and also in the early 90s, we had some huge interest rate increases and caused some havoc in the bond market. The fact that we have the inflation swap market or the bank could have used the inflation swap market, uh, do you think we're in a different circumstance? At least we would expect from such a bank to use the inflation swap market? Not sure. First of all, I'm not sure why they would use oh, the interest rate swap market, swap sorry. market oh, sorry. rather than the interest rate uh, yes. swap, uh, swap market. Second, given current accounting conventions, if they had used that and they had hedged a non-market uh, mark-to-market asset with what would have been a mark-to-market liability that would not have operated in the direction of necessarily reducing the relevant concepts of volatility. So I think the failure to fully hedge is also related to the inappropriate uh, treatment of uh, market value fluctuations uh, in assets. I think it's an obvious and egregious problem when uh, changes in the port so-called available for sale portfolio of banks are not reflected in uh, their capital. I think the existence and the whole concept of the hold to maturity of portfolio is something that is potentially quite problematic. I recognize the importance of the issues around uh, deposits and the sticky below, below market character of some deposits, but I would prefer to move to approaches that put more emphasis on market value, taking appropriate account where it's appropriate of uh, the issues on the deposit side that constitute a benefit uh, to banks. But here, where you had a whole, or you had a substantial hold to maturity portfolio, the deposits were uninsured, obviously potentially highly liquid and flighty, and very recently acquired you had almost a perfect storm of things that could potentially create a very difficult situation. Do you also think that this whole to maturity accounting actually affects the long-term yield of the long-term treasuries? Because many banks might be sitting on them and say, we can't really sell them because we would realize losses. And hence there's some locked in demand on long-term treasuries, which would not be the case if I you have am, not the market. Uh, I am open to a variety of uh, views. In general, my instincts put 
less emphasis on price pressure effects as determinants of uh, risk of term premiums than do many other uh, mm -hmm. market participants. And therefore, I tend also to assign a bit less significance to the price pressure aspects of uh, QE and to all the various effects over long periods of time. I don't doubt that there can be huge effects over short periods of time, particularly in illiquid markets, but I would be surprised if the impact on term premiums for long yields was terribly large if uh, this were changed over long periods of time. And even if it were, I would expect it to be much larger in the treasury market than I would expect it to be in other long-term uh, bond uh, in other long-term bond yields. So I think of all the arguments for hold to maturity accounting, helping the treasury sell longer-term debt in an advantageous way is one of the worst. And about QE, I mean, one could argue that the Fed did QE in this way. The financial sector doesn't have to hold so many long-term maturity treasuries, so it might make the situation better than without QE. Would you subscribe to that? Or think that's counterintuitive. This is a different uh, topic. Um, I find the American systems approach to the debt maturity of the debt that is held by the taxpayer uh, to be presumptively bewildering and inappropriate. We have simultaneously the spectacle of the treasury talking like corporate treasurers do, the importance of terming out uh, the uh, debt, the importance of containing rollover risk. At the same time that we have the Fed talking about the desirability of terming in uh, the debt on grounds of providing liquidity or uh, stimulus, and we have the brokers sitting in the middle making money um, as the Treasury issues longer term debt and the Fed participates in markets to do something about it. I think we need some apparatus for having one coherent decision about US debt maturity strategy that implicates all the various issues uh, that are involved. And I find it hard to think about how individual actors motivated by a subset of the concerns should act since it depends on what the effect of their actions will be on all the other uh, actors. So you would be open for a holistic rethinking of the whole structure, the maturity structure of U.S. Treasuries, QE of the Fed involvement, and open, to what extent the private sector. There are two different things I'd be open to. I would be very firmly of the view that the process needs to be completely changed mm -hmm. from the current process where the Treasury does what it does, pretending that that's determining the structure of the debt that's going to be held by the public. And the Fed does what it does, assuming that it's going to have no impact on what the Treasury uh, does. And nobody thinks about the many uh, equities uh, at the risk of doing what one should do only very rarely in settings like this. I would advertise a paper that I wrote some years ago with uh, Robin Greenwood and Sam uh Sam uh, Hansen that uh, laid out uh, these various issues in process and in terms of where we should uh, overall come, uh, come down. Perhaps somebody could put that paper in the chat for anyone, find that paper and put it in the chat for anyone who is uh, interested in uh, looking at it. So I was wondering, can we come back to the market power of deposits? So on the one hand, you could say, you know, 
banks, they have a lot of cheap retail funding, especially when the interest rate goes up, they still can you know, finance themselves fairly cheaply. And that gives them additional stability. Uh, and that's why they can actually hold this uh, maturity mismatch because they have some natural hedge by, you know, whenever the interest rate goes up, they get keep their cheap funding. And that's, you know, Philip Schnabler, Drexler paper and their focus on that. Would you argue that that's a good arrangement? We should get rid of it by introducing some CBDC or some interest bearing CBDC and then the market power is more constrained from the private banks? Or do you think that's too risky in terms of financial stability considerations? And, and the other thing is, if this is a high, very valuable as, asset in a sense, this market power on the deposit market, should it be reflected in the balance sheet in our accounting system? And uh, we touched upon it this briefly, but what's your taking or your thinking on, on this dimension? So if, if you'll permit me, uh, Marcus, uh, before we broaden out the aperture from, uh, mm -hmm. uh, from SVB, I'd like to make uh, one other uh, comment about an issue that pens. If we were dealing with a systemic financial institution, the rules would require that all the assets of the holding company be deployed in support of uh, the bank uh, which it held. We did not make such a declaration on Friday morning, but we did by Sunday decide that this was a systemic event. In that context, it is troubling to me that the investment made by bondholders uh, in holding bonds in SVB holding company is um, trading as richly as it is about 50 cents on the dollar. It is troubling to me that the holding company has not yet filed for bankruptcy, though it seems to me that it clearly is. And I think it will be important in terms of the political legitimacy of this exercise to pay close attention to the deferred comp liability for executives of the bank that is currently sitting with uh, the holding uh, company. So I think there are some issues around um, moral hazard type issues and proper accountability for investors type issues of the kind the authorities stressed that um, require close attention. And I am not uh, close to all of the legalisms and obviously one has to do things that are consistent with the rule of uh, law. But if it were to be the case, as I suspect it might be, and I'm not sure, that the holding company had deposits in the bank, I would be quite sorry to see the federal government guaranteeing those deposits of the holding company in the operating company bank for the purpose of meeting various economic actors, particularly the executives who had relationships with uh, the holding company. Uh, turning to... Um, Turning to your question, my instinct is that this is an issue that over time will uh, tend uh, to go away. It seems to me that we would expect in a competitive uh, market with competitive suppliers in the absence of concentration, in the presence of uh, money market uh, funds, in the presence of various schemes that enable people to be facilitated to invest directly in interest bearing uh, assets, that we should expect uh, that the premiums on deposits um, that are not compensation for the fact that banks are providing their deposit holders with uh, services that are costly to provide, I think we should expect that over time, 
competition will grind that away. And I think we should welcome that process. The Fed's aversion to supporting various narrow banking models has seemed uh, problematic. It seems to me that if I want to open a bank that simply takes deposits and buys treasury bills, mm -hmm. that should be an institutional innovation that uh, the Fed is welcoming on the grounds of the contribution to financial stability uh, that it is making rather than opposing on the grounds that it is a, a threat to traditional banking. Seems to me there are important issues of progressivity here since it's likely to be the wealthy who are gonna find ways to avoid having large amounts of their liquidity held in zero interest rate form. I wonder, Marcus, and this is not an area where I'm an expert and my view should be thought of as raising questions that policymakers should consider rather than offering confident judgments. I wonder if we had a much more primitive environment technologically 15 years ago. And since then, until very recently, we have had very low interest rates. And so we have not had uh, the coincidence mm -hmm. of high interest rates, um, the ability to highlight the highness of interest rates, and the rapid mobility that is created by uh, digital uh, banking um, to open accounts very quickly. I, I wonder if this isn't something that is likely uh, to uh, change um, over, uh, over time, independent of government uh, actions. To answer your other question, I think that insofar as there are sticky um, sticky lower interest rate balances, I think that ought to be reflected in the accounting system. My understanding is that well-managed institutions have very sophisticated models for understanding the liquidity of different categories of, uh, of banks of bank liability, bank liabilities, you know, the, um, there's a big difference between an uninsured deposit of a finance professor who does a lot of consulting that one should probably assume has very little stickiness and um, the, um, a stat, the deposit represented by an estate where the claimants on the estate have not been found for several years and where nobody's likely to pressure to raise, raise it. I think that should uh, be uh, worked uh, through. I think the whole concept of deposits and uninsured deposits need to be thought through carefully. Uh, the argument is always an argument about market discipline. But it seems to me that a startup company with $5 million in liquid assets that is trying to innovate a new AI application is really not well set up to be in the position of evaluating uh, the credit worthiness of a bank. And so I'm inclined to think that we want to move to a world where we are not relying on uh, depositors to perform that kind of uh, function, but rather conceiving capital structures where those who are more junior to depositors do have uh, that responsibility and where there are, where the collective wisdom of markets is uh, 
more extensively brought to bear. So just rephrasing it a little bit, what you're saying is that it's not really depositors, even if they're you know, big uh, tech companies or intermediate tech companies, it might be more the interbank market which can execute the discipline because these are other banks. But on the other hand, we also want the interbank market to channel funds back. Now, if, if the interbank market just says, you know, money is now flowing out of SVB to another bank, JP Morgan, and JP Morgan is just channeling the funds back through the interbank market, it stabilizes that. Um, but overall, I guess the the banks themselves can cause more, can exert more influence and more discipline on each other. Marcus, you're raising a you're raising an important point that I think I need to think that I think I need to think through more carefully. I had in mind less the interbank market than uh, the uh, subordinated debt securities mm -hmm. of uh, the banks. The securities that are potentially convertible into equity and the pricing of uh, those securities. And in all honesty, I haven't thought through carefully uh, what my views are on the interbank uh, market as a source uh, as a, as a source of uh, discipline. You know, I would just step back and say that there are many academics on this call, and there are many who are um, who devote a much larger fraction of their intellectual effort to this range of issues than I've had an opportunity to do. It seems to me, though, that if the 16th largest bank in the United States, with less than 1% of the banking assets of the United States, if its failure in a highly idiosyncratic way, in a highly idiosyncratic market, constitutes a systemic event because of the contagion it generates, that there's a great deal of conceptual rethinking around the structure of our financial system that is, uh, call, that is uh, called for and the idea that problems in major institutions can be contained within the current structure um, looks less plausible today than it probably did before uh, this set of events. So let me throw in some questions. So Brett DeLong outlines a certain thought experiment and said, let's suppose the regulators would have said, uh, on Monday, the FDIC gives people half of their money back, the uninsured money, and the rest it gives in on Tuesday in form of certificates that can trade. And then hopefully on Wednesday, uh, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, or JP Morgan Chase would then trade these certificates at par. Uh, how would you, such a movie, how would such a movie play out? And I would like to combine it with a question by Martin Mühleisen, who said, if you look in Europe and Cyprus, they tried this haircut as well, but it didn't really work. And then I had to backtrack uh, from that as well. So do you see, do you, how would you evaluate such an alternative a strategy where you say, I guarantee only 80% of the deposits, they are freely available, but 20% you get a certificate and it trades, I don't know, at a discount or hopefully down the road if some other bank jumps in at par. We have a um, general doctrine that I call huff and puff and pay, which is that the policymakers who in the early stages of crisis um, and confidence crisis give the strongest moral hazard speeches and impose the most brutal solutions on the people who they think are responsible end up authoring the largest uh, bailouts. And I would give as examples of that uh, doctrine, the actions of uh, Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill in the spring of 2001, when he gave very strong moral hazard speeches and two weeks later was supporting the largest bailouts in history 
for Turkey and Argentina. I would give the authorities who justified their non-action in Lehman on moral hazard uh, grounds and found themselves guaranteeing the whole financial system within uh, to uh, within uh, two weeks, I would give the British authorities who gave terrific moral hazard speeches after Northern Rock and found themselves authoring very large uh, bailouts. I lack the I as a policymaker lack the courage uh, to attempt the experiment uh, suggested uh, by my friend. Uh, Brad, in your question, I rather suspect that if Brad were a policymaker, he might lack uh, the uh, courage uh, of it. And I'm reminded of uh, the wisecrack uh, made with respect to those who um, advocated such approaches in the very early 1930s, that that was the kind of thinking that made the depression great. So um, I think that prudent people concerned with uh, risk uh, control would not have stuck with a strategy of um, a strategy of haircutting those deposits. I would say that my concerns, unlike some of my friends, my concerns last weekend were actually more about contagion than they were about uh, the problems with payroll uh, within Silicon Valley. I think people would have figured out ways of lending money to people to handle payroll and mm -hmm. the like, and that would have been very messy and that might have been sufficient ground to ensure the deposits of SVB. But my larger concerns last weekend were about uh, contagion. And how would you see, how well did the resolution work in your judgment? How, what grade would you give the authorities? And you know, that the fact that SVB, the holding company is, is, is still, yeah. I would, I, give, was, uh, I, I would, I would give uh, the authorities high grade. Uh, high grades uh, these days when uh, the average grade point average at Harvard or Princeton is 3.8, um, giving somebody an A is not a very strong statement since the majority of the grades are A, but I would certainly give them, I would certainly give people an A. Uh, questions I would ask are whether we could have averted some of this had we recognized that it was systemic on Friday during the day, rather than initially announcing we were going to haircut. Mm -hmm. I think there are questions about how the holding company is uh, going to be uh, handled. I am not entirely, I would have wanted to look very hard at the lending at par uh, feature of the Fed's facility. It may be that if I had been involved in the decision-making, I would have decided that that was necessary, but I would have found it painful to come to that conclusion. And I would have wanted to take warrants in institutions that made substantial use of borrowing above market value, between market value and par, I would have thought that if the Fed is going to provide that service, it should get in return a uh, sliver of equity in the form of warrants that had no control rights. Again, I want to be careful. I'm saying that is a question that if I had been a policymaker, I would have pushed and asked I might well have been persuaded that that was infeasible or a bad idea, but I think it's a question that should have been on the table. And in the various post-mortem analysis, I haven't seen uh, 
very much discussed. And if I just go a little bit ahead, so you know, you do repo on at par for US Treasury, it makes sense. But if you were to go to Europe and you have different sovereign bonds, would you, you know, how would you treat this uh, repo at par in Europe, depending there are different bonds with different riskiness underlying? It's even a more challenging. That's problem, another. That's another question. That's another good, good, good question where I don't have a well considered view. In general, I am uncomfortable with doing things that are based on uh, par values rather than uh, market values. I think there's a broad, and I'm also concerned about questions around the term of uh, lending. I think there's a view that many people have that somehow if you lend money against a highly volatile security um, with a high degree of leverage, that's a very risky thing to do. But I would rather lend somebody money 95% against their Apple stock with a one day um, screwing up on the margin, then lend somebody 50% against their shopping center with an every five year uh, truing up uh, because the asset is always held at its uh, value. And so in general, I would want to push things towards uh, more reliance on uh, market value. And it makes me nervous to uh, contemplate moving even further in that regard in a case like the European situation where there's credit risk um, as well as, uh, uh, as, as, well as uh, duration risk. So, if we, so Harold James would like to know, uh, probably in context of Credit Suisse, uh, you know, if there's also exchange rate risk. So, for example, if the Swiss National Bank has to lend to Credit Suisse in the foreign currency in dollars, and it might be that the, the country is not big enough to support such a big, large financial institution, to see this, do you see particular problem, problems then in central banking, what central banks would do? So, you have on top of. Uh, there are. Um, what do you think the swap arrangements will take care of that um, exchange rate component? The honest answer, Mar the honest answer is Marcus. I don't. Uh, I don't know. I think there is a serious, obviously a very serious set of issues involved in global institutions headquartered in relatively small uh, countries. I think the nature of the right answer involves um, the establishment of rules and principles that cause there to be separate holding companies in each of the major jurisdictions and therefore permit separate uh, resolutions in uh, separate uh, countries. I have a and the world community has worked extremely hard on this for uh, the last 15 years. And the United States is heavily invested in the idea that it can handle foreign banks located in the United States uh, come what may on the part of their local uh, regulators. How well that works, um, is something that I and was is likely to work. I think will be importantly tested uh, going forward with what happens at uh, credit uh, credits uh, at Credit Suisse. But I'm not in a position to make a clear recommendation on that. So let's go to the next topic, which are the implications of uh, monetary policy. And, uh, you know, Daryl Duffy pointed this out in one of these questions as well. So 
is there some financial dominance? I call this the financial dominance that, you know, the central bank might be limited how much it can fight inflation, given that it might cause some havoc in the financial markets. And, or does it have to act even stronger in order to signal that it is not guided by financial dominance? And do you think, you know, it would have been easier to start earlier with inflation fighting and have a more gradual approach? Was it a sharp increase in the interest rate which caused the, the tensions in the financial markets or among these banks? And so I would like to get your take. How do you manage that? So if we would not have intervened so strongly to save the bank and we had some contagion effects, it might also limit dramatically what we can do in order to fight inflation. Uh, so it's one motivation to be very forthcoming and guarantee, extend guarantees in order to keep the space, the policy space, to hike interest rates and uh, in order to contain inflation. Or would you say, but then anyway, there would be a credit crunch and the economy would tank. So inflation might not be an issue or we could also go to stagflation. I don't know how it will play out. So here I have uh, relatively clearer views than I do on some of the other uh, questions. I think uh, Christine Lagarde gets an A, gets an A plus uh, today. The fact that the ECB carried through on its monetary policy uh, plan did so with clear rhetoric separating the monetary policy concern from the financial stability concern pointed out that what's important when you have multiple objectives is to have multiple instruments and to be prepared to use the multiple instruments, I think was exactly uh, right. And the fact that people are able to listen to this seminar without obsessing on the volatility of markets every five minutes after the ECB raised rates by 50 basis points is, a, is evidence that uh, Christine Lagarde took uh, the right approach. And it would be my very strong hope that unless there are significant changes from current facts, which of course there might be, that will raise rates at uh, its next meeting and will make clear its preparedness to use the various uh, tools to address problems in financial uh, in, uh, fin in the financial in financial uh, institutions or in financial markets, so I think it is very important to signal um, very strong resistance to the idea of uh, financial dominance and to the idea of slacking off in uh, the effort to resist inflation um, because of uh, financial stability concerns. Now, I do think, and you touched on, you touched on this in the way you asked uh, the question, Marcus, that quite apart from anything about financial dominance, a reasonable observer looking at the US economy today, might well revise downwards their assessment regarding the flow of credit and therefore revise downwards their assessment about spending and therefore about inflationary pressure. And I think it's entirely appropriate that the central bank in making judgments about uh, monetary policy take account of factors that are influencing the flow of credit, just like it would take account of a big change in a big defense buildup or would take account of a change in the animal spirits of consumers or uh, anything else. My judgment is that at this point, the likely effect is not sufficiently large and the inflation problem in the United States is sufficiently large that I think it is appropriate to raise rates by 25 uh, basis points at the next uh, meeting. But I wanna be very clear that 
there are two rationales for financial disturbances leading to a change in the monetary policy path. One, financial dominance, which I would want very, very much to resist. And the other, assessment of economic conditions, which I think is right to take account of, but just not sufficient to make a case for not moving rates on current facts. And of course, current facts could change uh, very rapidly as one learns more um, about uh, what, the, uh, what the situation is. I do think that if uh, the Fed had um, not allowed itself to fall so far behind uh, the curve um, during 2021 and the earlier part of 2022, there would have been a more gradual set of adjustments of interest rates and that would have been an environment that would have been more conducive to uh, financial stability. I also think it's important to remember that the considerations that we're discussing that are relevant here primarily have to do with the level of longer term rates rather than, the le rather than real rates and therefore falling behind the curve and allowing inflation expectations to rise uh, is not conducive uh, to financial stability. So being perceived as having a financial dominance uh, problem might well exacerbate uh, difficulties, both ironically in terms of inflation expectations and in terms of recession forces, because if the Fed were to decide not to act, people would think if they're so scared, maybe I should be so scared as well and adjust their spending uh, plans. So on current facts, I would be very strongly of the view that the Fed should be moving um, next week. Can I just uh, jump in a little bit on, you know, uh, hiking rates versus quantitative tightening. So quantitative tightening essentially you affect more the long end of the yield curve and writing hikes, uh, hiking rates, you affect more the short end of the yield curve. And as you said, it's mostly the long end, which is for many banks a problem. Uh, so you would say if you were to give in on financial dominance, you would give in on quantitative tightening rather than on rate hikes? Probably, probably uh, yes, Marcus, for the reason you say, but heavily qualified by two things I said earlier. One, that I believe these price pressure effects are a little smaller than many others believe they are. And two, I really have trouble relating to these discussions of the maturity of America's debt that are partial from the perspective of one, but not both of the involved institutions. Mm -hmm. Great, so that uh, at least the topic of uh, the whole monetary policy implications of the current events. But we touched upon already earlier, you know, should we actually restructure the whole financial architecture, go to more narrow banks, or at least don't hinder narrow banks. And that, as you said earlier, does it, is it a big deal if, for example, the US Treasury has much more short-term T-bills rather than long-term bonds. And this way, the financial sector, the private sector doesn't have to do so much maturity transformation. And it seems like the private sector is not so good in doing this maturity transformation. Why do we ask the private sector to do it? It could be the Treasury doing it on its own, knowing that the Fed can be ready any, at any moment to help out. And I think especially for the US, there's no argument why the government sector cannot do the maturity transformation on its own. Or do you see a big rollover risk if the debt is in dollar and you have the Fed potentially stepping in? Or do, is this rollover risk overplayed? And I mean, you touched upon this earlier. The, the, paper, the paper that uh, I referenced uh, earlier that I wrote with uh, Greenwood and, um, 
and uh, Hansen and uh, Rudolph talked about uh, exactly these uh, these questions. My general views are, yes, we should be enthusiastic about narrow banks, whether we should be actively discouraging other banks, I'm far from sure, but we should be enthusiastic about uh, narrow banks. I share your instinct, uh, the in I don't know what's your instinct, but the instinct behind uh, the question on shorter term uh, debt is for, I put it slightly differently than uh, you did, even if it was a little bit riskier in terms of government rollover uh, risk, it is safer in terms of overall financial system. Uh, mm -hmm risk, which is presumably the objective. I would add the observation that in a world where long-term inflation is uncertain, real borrowing costs, which are presumably what the government should worry about, may be more predictable with a short-term debt-based strategy than with a long-term uh, debt-based uh, strategy. And that rollover risk is ultimately a matter of confidence in the country, and it's probably better to deal with it at the government level than at the banking uh, level. I would say my principal hesitation um, and why I'm not confident, completely confident where I would come down comes from the fact that there's a different set of arguments in which I've been involved over the years, having to do with the use of fiscal stimulus, having to do with government debt, having to do with the set of issues that Olivier Blanchard has stressed involving R versus uh, G, interest rates versus growth rates. And that in general tells you that if you have an opportunity, you may be able to engage prudently in more expansionary fiscal policy if you can lock in mm -hmm. low real interest rate uh, borrowing. And a it was at certain points my view uh, pre-pandemic that we should be having more expansionary fiscal policy and financing it uh, long financing it longer term. And that, of course, goes in the opposite uh, direction. Oh, do you, I think, I would, I, think I would. I think I would. I think where that argues is towards an approach that emphasizes issuing longer-term indexed securities and shorter-term nominal uh, securities as part of an integrated uh, debt management. Uh, strategy. And that would be where my instinct at this point would be. But it's uh, some of my views are like my view on monetary policy are quite strongly held and would be a recommendation to actual policymakers. Some of my views, like the ones I just expressed, are what I would be thinking about and what would be my hypothesis as a policymaker but not a judgment that I would be reaching with confidence. Thanks a lot. Let me allow me that I say that, of course, you introduced when you were US Treasury Secretary, the TIPS market. So we have the TIPS market because of you. So that's a big a lifetime achievement. Um, so at the end, let's come back to the global perspective a little bit. We talked already about uh, Europe. You know, how should they deal with risky bonds? Should they also this at, uh, at par collateral? Uh, it's more challenging there. We talked about Credit Suisse a little bit about the dollar shortage. Of course, the Swiss National Bank also has a lot of dollar assets on the other side. But we haven't talked about Japan yet. Are there any lessons, uh, you know, what we have learned in the last week for the yield curve control, how to lift the yield curve control, and what are the implications for the financial sector? Do you think there are some lessons for the Japanese situation as well? There's a a broad principle that pegs of any pegs of any kind are a hotel that is easier to check into than it is to check out of. Mm -hmm. And there's always a temptation to bring stability with 
pegs and confidence and the argument is, well, if we just peg it and we tell everybody we're going to peg it and they believe we're going to peg it, then we won't have to actually spend money pegging it. And so it's really terrific. And I think there's a kind of broad lesson that those things often don't end well. There's more, much more experience in that regard in the exchange rate area than there is in the yield curve control area. But I think there is that kind of idea in uh, the yield curve control area as well. So my instinct would be um, that Japan needs to gingerly exit uh, yield curve control to uh, maximize its uh, prospects for uh, stability. But I would emphasize uh, the word uh, gingerly uh, in, uh, in, that re in that regard. And so finally, let's talk about the emerging economies and developed economies. Let's suppose a similar scenario would have played out in some emerging economy. I mean, the US is in a very good position to handle these uh, hiccups and then keep it under control, also because of the dominance of the dollar and it doesn't cause some you know, uh, uh, payment of balance uh, problems. If you were in an emerging economy, would face a similar circumstances. How would it play out there differently? Would you say there's some different considerations to take to be taken into account? Uh, more complications, or you would say you would do similar things, or you would not be able to do these guarantees because your balance sheet is not the national balance sheet is not. I think, yeah, it would be. I would be quite surprised if it was a good idea for emerging market economies to have in, to be guaranteeing uh, large chunks of the liabilities of the 20th largest or 25th largest or 30th largest uh, institution in their uh, in their country. And so I would want to my instincts in the context of European of emerging economies, would be to would be more towards national champion uh, institutions versus and then a periphery of institutions which did not have a strong uh, safety net rather than the kind of situation rather than doing the equivalent of an SVB bailout uh, in a emerging uh, economy. I've been involved over the years in discussions of foreign owned institutions in uh, emerging uh, economies. This is something I have had a chance to discuss over the years with Mexican policymakers who within the group of Mexican financial market uh, policymakers, there are quite different views on the health or ill health of having external ownership of uh, their institutions. My instincts for the reasons you say tend to run to global diversification uh, mm -hmm. for emerging market institutions for the same way that I'm much more comfortable with federally chartered institutions in the United States then I'm comfortable with only state chartered institutions that don't have access to uh, the Fed discount window. Before we totally close, did the last week's event change your opinion about anything about stable coins and crypto space, also in light of the Signature Bank? Um, I, I think uh, that uh, one needs to be very, very uh, careful uh, in that entire uh, space. I think that what policymakers need to think about very carefully is whether regulation encourages or discourages some of the good things. There's a tendency to say there's risk, there's uncertainty, bad things are happening. But, you know, I think we make a clear decision 
that the government does not involve itself in saying that some cigarettes are safer than other cigarettes, because if it did, it would be legitimating cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And I think that a similar kind of thinking needs to affect how we think about uh, regulatory policy uh, in the uh, in the crypto uh, area. And I do think that we need to, and this is a comment about the crypto area, but it's actually a kind of broader area. I think the field of uh, financial regulation would benefit from more extensive considerations of the lessons of public choice theory that over time, regulation often shifts from protecting the uh, rest of society from what may go on in a given industry to protecting a given industry from the uh, pressures that may come on it from the rest of society. And I think that's something we need to uh, very carefully uh, consider in the financial area, given the magnitude of public resources that are put behind uh, financial institutions in difficulty. Thanks a lot, Larry. This was, you know, as always, extremely insightful and we learned a lot. We typically want to end up with a positive note. If you have some positive statement at the end, uh, you can make a brief positive note if from the last week's uh, experience or something. Sure, um, look, I think the, the news is uh, that today in Europe, a day after huge drama in Credit Suisse, the European authorities were able to carry through on their monetary policy plan uh, without uh, substantial uh, tremors in financial markets. And that suggests that a broad approach of separating macro from uh, micro is a workable uh, approach. And while there will be important uh, lessons for all the people on this call and many others to debate and uh, discuss on current facts, I would be quite surprised if students in US history, taking a US history course in 2035 will have cause to learn about uh, this particular episode. And that's how we want it to be. The same could not be said of 2008. Mm. Great. Thanks a lot, Larry, and uh, we stay in touch. And thanks again Thank you. also to all the participants. Uh, we will see each other next week again, talking about the German hyperinflation in 1919 to 1923 with Emil Werner from MIT. Thanks. See you soon.